We've looked at this paradigm from a very simple principle that the system follows, and which is self versus non-self discrimination. That's the essential decision the immune system has to make at the highest level when it encounters a signal. So autoimmune diseases is essentially inappropriate recognition of self as non-self. Susceptibility to cancers or infections is inadequate recognition of something that's foreign and you should react to. That's a fundamental principle. And the reason I focus the entire R&D organization on that is if we understand that, it gets us to the why, not the what. We're not interested in singular molecules and singular cytokines. They've been tremendously successful. We want to make the next leap forward. And the question we ask ourselves is if we can get to the basis of these questions, does this put us in a different space? And the answer is yes, it does. It becomes transformational for the patient and the disease. And here are some examples exactly to what you were talking about. So if you look at the T cell repertoire, this is the diversity of T cells that all of us harbor in our bodies, anywhere between 10 million to 25 million different kinds of receptor specificities that are essentially there to, to recognize a diverse array of antigens. You don't know what tomorrow's Ebola is going to look like, or 10 years in the West Nile is going to look like, so you want to be prepared. And what you see on the left is a panel of an autoreactive T cell repertoire on the Y axis as a function of time with age. We all harbor these specificities. In most of us, they're just never triggered. You have a key decision point that's marked by number one, where you've got an environmental insult. Something happens, an infection, stress, something you encounter that activates that particular T cell repertoire against your self tissue to start recognizing it as foreign. That earliest inflection point, I believe, if we could recognize that and track it, which is doable with the immune repertoire, puts you in a whole different space than the chronic stages of disease. There is a stage between number one and number two where that repertoire is expanding. It's on a slow burn. It's going, it's mm -hmm. literally a clonal expansion, one to two, two to four, so on and so forth. And at some critical point in that space, if you could intervene, then you can see by that dotted green line, you bring it back to baseline. You've turned the course of disease. Where you start to show symptoms is after the stage of number two, where you have frank tissue damage, signatures of inflammation, and that's what we're trying to address at this point. We believe with the platform we have, which is a novel biologics platform, it gets to this point. Similarly, if you look at the other spectrum, now we're talking about susceptibility to cancers, the decision is exactly the same, except now it's in reverse and benefits the host, which is you want an anti-tumor T cell repertoire to be triggered when you've got a malignancy that's detected in the earlier stages that provides sterilizing immunity. And we know this can happen in the small number of patients that respond positively to checkpoint therapies. In some cases, you've got lasting complete responses. People don't like to use the word cure in cancer immunotherapy. But when you're off drug and you're, you know, you're going past decades, and I used to be at BMS in the early days of epilimumab and never very fortunate to have had that experience, you're seeing this. So you have your immune system has the potential and you can harness it to really to the extremes. And in this case, as you ramp up the repertoire to the particular determinants of the tumor antigens, you should see control of tumor growth. I would argue in most cases, as we're looking at therapies for cancer immunotherapy, we still don't have a very good understanding whether the individual primed this in the first place or not. So going in with molecules that unleash the immune system without fully understanding what the breadth is becomes very important. Where I think the challenge is in understanding what are the sensitive diagnostics and where do you sample them. Mm -hmm. The best way to do this is, of course, in blood. In cases of autoimmune diseases, particularly the poignant case of type 1 diabetes that you mentioned, these can be sampled in blood. There may be certain instances for other diseases we may need other sites to sample from. That may be disease-specific, oriented. I think correlating the specificities back to the therapeutic becomes an important challenge as to how quickly do you translate that information and generate the therapeutic. That's something we're faced with ourselves. If you gave us 10 different tumor targets, can you prosecute all at the, in, in, in parallel or do you? So there's a, there's a whole innovation, I think, around platform and protein engineering that has to accompany the biology and the thinking there. But I do think in the next about, I'd say about five, five years or so, we're going to see a lot of movement in this space. And I think it's, the trend is going to be likely driven by cancer immunotherapy simply because of the ramped up need. But I would say the vast, enormous opportunity in autoimmune disease and in inflammation is still to be fully recognized. And I come back 
to the concepts around neurodegeneration, neuroinflammation, metabolic inflammation. These are these have been diseases that have conventionally not been defined in a particular immune context, but more and more are coming forth, and we're appreciating these mechanisms underlying this inflammation. If you feel, if you actually sort of think about it, uh, metabolic type, type 2 diabetes even, if that comes back to this concept of recognizing something that's aberrant, there's no, there's no reason to believe, there's no reason to think that one could not apply these in that, in that sort of setting.